This time on Finnegan's Garage, a very special project. We are building a billet LSX engine here at Ace Racing Engines for a car I've never shown you. And I, I don't know if you're gonna see it in this video either. Um, we're a long ways away from showing you that thing. However, this is ready to go together. So today, tips and tricks for building a really, really nice LSX engine. <laughs> You ready? You ready? Go get it. Oh, dude, you're too fast, man. This is Ace Racing Engines. My goodness. They like the Fox body wagons. And they like Billet. Look at that intake. My goodness. So here's the deal. I told you guys in the past, I want to do drag week, and I want to go faster than I can in blasphemy. And it's kind of a long-term goal. I don't have a specific date for when I want to do it. However, I have bought a roller, and I've slowly been socking money away and buying parts for that roller. And no, I haven't shown it to you on the channel yet. You haven't seen it. I don't know when I'm gonna show it to you because I really wanna finish the Cadillac before I start that project. However, some of the parts I've bought are ready to go together, namely the engine. This engine never came in this car and a lot of people out there probably will believe it doesn't belong in it. I don't really care. You guys know that. I don't really care. It's my car. I'm gonna build it how I want. And all of that will make more sense to you someday when I show you the car. But for now, just know we are building one hell of an LS engine. Truth be told, this is the first time I've ever been to Ace Racing Engines. Its proprietor, Steph Rossi, I know only because we've been drunk at the PRI show a bunch of times. That's really how I know him. He's one of those people that I follow on Instagram. His attention to detail really impressed me and I felt comfortable commissioning him to do something that I've never done before, which is assemble a billet engine. If you guys follow him on Instagram, you'll notice his shop is very clean, very organized. His tools are the best of the best and he clearly knows how to use them. And anyway, today in the clean room, that Noonan engine block, which is LS based, is ready to go together. So we're gonna start Working on the short block, I don't think we'll get it done tonight, but we're gonna start on it and we're gonna give you guys some tips for uh, checking bearing clearances and whatnot, because Lord knows he's got the right tools to do that. Hi, Steph. All right, let's get after it. The car, as you know, I've not told anybody what it is, but I have told the people just now out there that this engine never came in this car and it really doesn't belong in it. But if you're gonna do drag and drive events and you're gonna break down, which we all do, but I break down a lot. Having an LS based engine is helpful since half the field is gonna have that thing. They're not all gonna have billet engine blocks, obviously, but consumable items, you know, you, you smoke a starter or an alternator or, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Bolt on stuff. The bolt on stuff, yeah. you know, like this, this is a Noonan billet engine block. And really, it's just the exterior accessories that are gonna be compatible with your garden variety LS timing cover, starter, you know, oil paint. Not timing cover. Not the timing cover. No. Okay, Gage even off. less. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about the block because it's the first time I've ever seen it in person. The machine work is bananas. The tool paths are amazing. Why bill it instead of cast aluminum? Like if, if you're, let's just say, so my goal is to go sixes in the quarter in my unknown project car. Why go bill it instead of cast? So cast will go up to a certain amount of power, but See, if, if detonation or on the brink of detonation, you'll be, for example, Westberg, the guy that went sick week with the S10, he yep. has one of my engines, that's a 400 cubic inch, same size as this, um, but cast aluminum, dark block. He knows, the tuner knows, I know, that's why I look so worried when I'm on the start line and when he's going down the track. Right. That he's pouring the coals of that thing, 57, 60 pounds of boost. We know that eventually the block will crack. And it, that's just the nature of the cast material. Okay. The other side of that is cast iron, which we use as well, which will make great power and last a long time. But eventually that will crack in the mains. Okay. So on an LS deal, you can crack the webbing for the mains then. Yeah. And on the cast aluminum one, they've been known to split the whole block. Now that might be detonation when the whole, everything gets rattled, it does a lot of stuff to it. You'll see, you know, transfer on the caps to the block. Okay. Think, you know, the, the bearing, the, our biggest enemy in the LS engine platform is number three and four um, being wiped out, uh, the lower. Um, obviously converters here, thrusters in the middle, 
Mm -hmm. All that force from the converter is pushing this way. Crank tends to want to flex like a banana right okay. here when you're giving it real serious cylinder pressure, detonation on the brink of detonation, or, or making power quarter mile out the big end of the track, mile an hour in the car, right. basically. So that's why this one, which you can get in the cast blocks, but it's, it, it's, it's not nowhere near as strong as the billet. This will last forever. We can weld it if you window it, which you probably won't hopefully ever window yeah, it. But, um, you know, we can weld it where you couldn't do that with iron. You wouldn't really want to do it with cast aluminum either. I don't have to worry about you making 3,500 horsepower. Are you going to push the mains out of this thing? Because it's going to live. Um, cool. But also the one thing we do to get around that thing I was talking about with the crank being like a banana is this has the Cleveland main forward size journal. So the, the main journal is 2,750. The bore in the block is like 2.942 bore versus that of an LS would be 2560 on the crank. So so it's under 200 thousandths of an inch in diameter? Yeah, So, and the reason they tend to whip is primarily 3750 stroke, four inch stroke, 4125 stroke. The overlap gets smaller because the mains is so, are so small on an LS, but okay. you're making power like a big block, you know, but you don't have that big block 2.2 rod journal or, you know, the 2750 mains. Well, now we do. The overlap here between the- Is this the crank? Yeah, this is your crank, yeah. Between the rod journal and the main journal, this has a big block 2.2 .2 pin on it, not an LS 2.1 pin. That looks familiar to me. Yeah, so all, I know, all I know are big blocks. Like the reason I'm here is all I've ever built are big blocks. And so this is new territory to me. In fact, I didn't even know you guys were using big block rod journals in this thing. All in, in, in Nor did I know the crank would be polished on the counterweights, Jesus. Yeah, it's beautiful. It Windberg is. Too. Beautiful job. Oh, this is a Windberg crank. Yeah. And eighth mile, light car, not really a problem, but quarter mile, drag and drive, heavier car, making, you know, 3,000 plus mile an hour out the back end, that's going to whip. So, so in your opinion, shouldn't. at what power level do you consider, like, let's just say your goal is longevity. Obviously, you can take a stock LS block pretty far. You can take an aftermarket aluminum one really far. If your goal is longevity, at what power level do you switch to something like this? I would say above 2,500 horsepower. Okay. Is when crank horsepower is when you should switch to a billet block. We've done more. My own car had the dark LS next to iron block. Mm -hmm. Michael is making just a little bit more than that with the aluminum block. Um, but you know, we, we know to look after that. You know, his tuner is great, Andreas, he knows to look after it. And by that, I mean, we were in less timing out the big end, you know, command the richer AFR out the back end of the track, stuff like that. Right. And really get after it in the in the 330, really. Right. And that's where it's done. And then taper it out. out yeah. Back. Because mile an hour is quarter mile in, in a, is really, you know, heavy, yeah. hard on the, on the crankshaft and on everything. In the quarter mile versus the eighth mile. Got it. The other thing is, is cast iron is heavy. Aluminum much lighter. Are the billet ones lighter than the cast aluminum blocks? They're around the same. I would probably say this is a little bit heavier than the cast aluminum block, within around 10 or 20 pounds. Okay. Versus and the, the iron ones, 100 pounds heavier than this. And this thing basically started out as one big chunk of aluminum. Yeah. What grade of aluminum is it? Is it 6061 or something? I think it is 6061, yeah. Wow. How long does it take Noonan to machine all that material out of this I thing? I think it's something like 37 hours, maybe 34 wow. hours, something like that. That's why they cost so much. That chunk of aluminum is expensive. Yeah. And then the machine time is expensive. I mean, look how much of it has gone from, from where it originally started as yeah. a solid block. Look at that. Like you can see the contour of the cylinder there. Like that's how much they've removed. Yeah. Their tool paths are beautiful. All the, the, everything's done with a bull mill and, and everything. It's just the finish is amazing. All right. So obviously, you know, we can't build the whole engine right now. <laughs> but if you are at home considering building your own or you just want to be more educated like me so that the next time you hire someone to build an engine, let's talk about basic stuff. So this engine has been machined. It has been washed. It has been cleaned. It has been deburred. Sorry, the engine block. It is ready to assemble. We have a crank that's already balanced. We have pistons and pins and rods that have already been weighed and balanced. Really the next step is making sure we have oil clearance between the bearings and the journals of all these parts that have to rotate. Wow. It's a bit wet because it's just solvent from washing it, but. That is gorgeous. I'll tell you what, pictures don't do it justice. 
You know, you'd been sending me pictures of it, which was cool, but until you get here in person. I just took my hoodie off because it's warm in here, and it just occurred to me that you do all of this measuring work at a certain temperature every day of your life. And I have heard that temperature will affect the reading of a dial bore gauge probably a micrometer, all this stuff expands yeah. and contracts different heats. I've never actually had the ability to measure oil clearances on a 60 degree day in my garage and then come back and do the same thing on a 90 degree day to see what the differences are. What, what are your thoughts on that? Obviously you keep it in here at a certain temperature, so it, there's, yeah. we keep it's it important. 71, 72 degrees in here, Fahrenheit, which I have no clue what that is in Celsius, but I do everything in Celsius. So. <laughs> oh, 21. 21 Celsius. 21 Celsius. Yeah, so- like, For the rest of the world. The metric system sounds so cold and unforgiving. <laughs> Celsius. This is step-by-step -step how to measure and set your oil clearance between your main bearings on an LSX engine here at Ace Racing Engines. So for you guys at home that have never done this, maybe you're having somebody build an engine, you just wanna be more educated. Maybe you're gonna build an engine yourself. What we're doing is we're gonna determine the bore size of the mains we're going to measure the main journals on this Winberg crankshaft. We're gonna measure the thickness of our cleavite bearings, which have been coated by calico coatings right here. And we're gonna take all those numbers of the dial bore gauge and figure out what have we got? What is the distance between the crank journal and the bearing when it's all installed in this engine block? What oil clearance do you try for them on the mains? I usually do 3000 on my stuff. For this, with the aluminum caps mm -hmm. and the power they're going to do, um, I will probably shoot between three two to three five. Okay. Cold. And what weight oil do you stick in something with that kind of oil clearance? Fifty weight. Okay. So step one would be set this. This okay. is a dial bore gauge. Yeah, set the dial bore gauge. Yeah. Um, to the size of the main housing that I want. So this is a digital micrometer. So he's setting this to his ideal bore size of the block. And then he's gonna zero this, which is called a dial bore gauge, on the micrometer. And once he sets this to zero, when he inserts this into the bores of the block, whatever number it tells you is the variation between the ideal and the actual. And this is, the big numbers are thousandths of an inch. So that's the outside, that's the inside of the of the cap. So we're seven tenths bigger than what I set the the bore gauge. All right, and what he's doing is you don't want it on the parting line because obviously that's not going to give you an accurate measurement. You don't want it on the oil hole. And then we swing it. When I say swing it, it's small movements to find the low spot. And some of these as well to confuse things even more we'll give a bigger size on these two than we will on the rest of them. Really? So you'll line hone this bigger on yeah. these two intentionally? And if that means taking these two, these three caps off and, and making that five tenths bigger, then, then so be it. And that's because these are the ones people have issues with on LS engines. Yeah, okay. because of where the thrust is yeah. and how thin. Thrust is number three, right? Yeah, yep. and how thin the counterweights are. I have a Hemi, in a big block crank, but they're, yeah, we can open are thin counterweights. Yeah. We can put the Hemi in the big block crank next to it to show comparison, but yeah, they're really thin. And then the overlap, um, so you're always fighting against that. So the more clearance you can give it, the more space it will have if it whips. Did this part of it, because this is part of my machining mm -hmm. stage. Yeah, you've already done this. Yeah, before I clean it, but I haven't done any bearing clearances or measured the crank. Okay. So I already knew what they were, but now it's uncharted for both of us. So now we know, we know what the bore size is in the block. Now, are you gonna measure the bearings or the journals? Crank. Okay. While I'm measuring the crank, you could take the caps off if you want. Sure, I'll slide hammer some stuff. Now, you're setting this to the theoretical diameter of what the journal should be. You've got a standard in there, it looks like. Two inch standard. We're gonna be around two, 2750 nominal is the size. Which is not an LS size, right? No, so as much as people like to joke about LS's being the Gen 2 small block Ford, and now it has, a small, some, well, it can have Cleveland Ford. This is Ford Cleveland sized mains? Yeah. Which is 2750? Yeah, and we use the Cleveland bearing as well. So the bearing is a Ford part number. 
So two, seven, four, eight. So we're undersized, just a hair. Normally they're around that, around two thousand smaller, and, and that is because the crankshaft companies. We we talk obviously when we order them. We say you know what I want it finished, polished too. But they also know that a crankshaft of this nature is going to be used in something like this. Right. Probably see sixty pounds of boost put down its throat. With the most we've gone over size on on this it is fifteen. Tents, which is a thou and a half, and, and that is a, like the bearing is quite loose um, before you tighten it down, crush. But it works. The bearing doesn't spin. There's enough clearance, and it doesn't and it doesn't catch the bearing when it whips. But they do that, so you don't have to do that on the block. So okay. the bearing's nice and tight, but you still get the bearing clearance where you want with a HX, because even with a HX. And when you say HX for the extra clearance, uh, so HX is really where it's at. And if you can't go any bigger than the HX, you go. Uh, any more clearance for the HX, you'll go bigger on the housing. A couple of engines we have that are, uh, and, they, and they know about it, and because that's the power they're going to make, they're, you know, a thou to a thou and a half oversize of the big limit that they give you. Okay. And um, so the crankshaft being two thou undersize yep. really helps us not have to go a thou or a thou and a half over the big end limit of the block main housing. Right. The spec, the, the, the spec. factory spec right. for the block, for bearing crush. So we now know our bore size. We now know our journal size. Yeah, you gotta take the caps off. Now we gotta take the caps it's off. It's a nice workout. Here comes the slide hammer because we have to jerk every one of these out of there. Just removed all of the bolts out of the side skirts. All of the bolts, I'm sorry, all of the nuts and washers off the main studs. Just slide hammered all of the caps off. God, they're light, they're aluminum. And now uh, Steph's already washed the bearings, I believe. And now we're gonna install them into the block. And uh, at that point, once it's torqued back down, we can start measuring our bore size. Do you have any special tips for doing this? We gotta put plenty of grease on the caps, but as you just saw how tight they are. Right. And, um... So you grease what, the sides? Yeah, well, so we'll grease this side and this side right here. Okay. To try and mitigate as much as this marring as you can. We'll start from the middle and work our way out. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful. I use microfibers. On cast iron, they're pain in the ass or aluminum because they, they'll snag on these ones. It's awesome to work with because you can just wipe everything clean with a clean microfiber. You can see how much you had to clearance the sleeve for the rods. They come down with a real long ball mill and then clearance that. Oh, you mean you can get in there with an angle grinder? <laughs> okay, this is the thrust bearing. You can tell it is a thrust bearing because it's got a flange on each side. And that goes in the number three main on an LS. Same as a Ford as well, but Ford doesn't have anywhere near thin counterweights. They're thin, but not as thin as the LS. And you say Ford, which Ford are you referring to? Cleveland. Cleveland. Yeah. Do you want to have the other? I would love to beat the snot out of this thing. <laughs> My God, that's tight. I'm going to put so, the camera down. So you do side to side, yeah, straight? Just straight's fine. This one's fine, but when you come to do the ones that aren't the thrust, the, the thrust is held in here, the, the bearing falls out. <laughs> so when the crank's in, you use the two hammer trick. Oh. So you get the one hammer. Two handles. On here, and then you hit. <laughs> nice. Hit it with another hammer, and then it. Sometimes it still does happen sometimes. <laughs> so sometimes you might get it started and then wind it down. I mean, you can see, that's how tight the fit is. You can see the grease shearing off right there. That sounded like we're there. Kind of looks like we're there. Yeah, you're there. Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody. Main caps are in and they are torqued with our bearings in place. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this measurement, which is the diameter of the journal of the crankshaft, and we have a dial bore gauge, which we are gonna set to that. That becomes our standard. When we insert the dial bore gauge, it's gonna get zeroed right now in this digital micrometer. That gets set to zero. So in theory, this is the same size as the journal of the crank. So now, when Steph sticks it in here, this obviously is bigger than the crank, but by how much? And in the number one main, it looks like it's somewhere... Three, three. Around a little over three thousandths of an inch, which is what you wanted, right? Yeah. 
under three, five. Number three, six, three, seven there. So we're probably going to switch. That one's a little tighter. Three, one, three, two. So number three, three is... Three, we only have a couple of thrust bearings that we can switch out. But all the other ones we can change. Right. So like, so like if this one, let's just say you measured this and it was four thousandths of an inch and you want three and a half thou, you could take this one, switch it into one that measures tighter. Uh, we'll probably, yeah, if we could get two and a half tenths of shell. If not, we'd put half a H in. So do you have any that are too tight or too loose? Tightest one is this one, two five to two seven, which honestly for, for that journal, being an aluminum block and aluminum cap, I'm not worried about. It's gonna expand. Uh, um, yeah, this one, I want a little bit more. Um, probably a few tenths more. Honestly, it would probably be fine, but I'd like to be, have a couple of tenths more. And these two are a couple of tenths less. And then we'll all be around the three, so two, these, three, three. Animals. So number one and two had more clearance than you want. Yeah. Number three and five had less than you want. Yeah. So this set of bearings will probably go into number two. Mm -hmm. And this uh, and that set of bearings will go into there, and then these set of bearings will probably get swapped out with. Another, I'll measure them in the measuring center here. The other way of doing it is, which is why we haven't got the cam bearings in yet, is is I could line hone it as well, right? Um, to 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 get it where exactly where I want it to, without messing around with the bearings. But for you guys at home, if you're if you're building your own engine, or you know if you're watching this video just because you're curious about some of the basic steps of how an engine gets built. That is how you determine what your oil clearance is on your main bearings for your crankshaft. The technique is very similar to measuring the oil clearance for the rod bearings, but essentially all you're doing is figuring out the gap between this bearing and this surface of the crankshaft, which is spinning. Mm -hmm. And this is close enough that we'll get it to where we want it to be by just changing out shells to have various boxes of bearings in there. And that's how that gets done. Thanks for watching Finnegan's Garage. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll be back here real soon with more cool stuff for you guys to learn.